This is the last video in this first introduction section of Unit 1. We're going to tie things up by looking at reaction energy diagrams. Energy diagrams allow us to represent both qualitatively and quantitatively what happens to energy during a chemical reaction. Recall from the last video that we could classify reactions into exothermic and endothermic reactions. In an exothermic reaction, as the reaction proceeds, energy is released. This means that some energy that had been stored in the chemical bonds of the reactants is now transformed into heat or light energy and is released to the surroundings. And that means that the amount of chemical energy in the products must be less than the energy that was stored in the reactants. And the difference between those values is the energy that's released as heat or light. During an endothermic reaction, energy is absorbed from the surroundings. This means that energy that was in the surroundings as heat, or occasionally light, is now absorbed by the chemicals and incorporated into the chemical bonds of the products. In turn, this means that the amount of chemical energy in the product molecules must be greater than that in the reactants, with the extra energy having been absorbed from the surroundings to make up the difference. This change in energy between the reactants and products of a reaction is a key feature of all chemical reactions, and we have a special term to describe it. It's called a change in enthalpy. Enthalpy is the energy stored in the bonds of a molecule. Different bonds have different enthalpies, so when a chemical reaction occurs, and old bonds are broken and new bonds are formed, a change in enthalpy occurs. Now the actual enthalpy of a molecule is difficult to measure, but changes in enthalpy are not. We do that just by looking at how the temperature of the surroundings changes when a reaction occurs. The size of the change in enthalpy tells you about how much energy is involved. That seems obvious. But the sign of an enthalpy value is also important. It tells you whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Now notice that the symbol for change in enthalpy is delta H. H is the symbol for enthalpy and the capital Greek letter delta, the triangle, means change in or difference between. So a negative delta H value means that energy was lost during the reaction. So this would be an exothermic reaction. So you've got the reactant enthalpy minus the energy that gets released equals the product enthalpy. On the other hand, a positive delta H means that energy was gained during the reaction. So this would be an endothermic reaction. So you would have the reactant enthalpy plus the energy that gets absorbed equals the product enthalpy. OK, so far so good. We're beginning to develop a graph that shows us how the energy changes during a reaction. But there's another important feature that we haven't yet included. It's called the activation energy and has the symbol of a large E with a small subscript A. In all reactions, there's a certain amount of energy that needs to be added, regardless of whether it's exothermic or endothermic, before the reaction can get started. The reason for this is that bonds in the reactant molecules usually need to be broken before the atoms can be rearranged to form the products. Breaking bonds requires energy, so a certain amount of energy has to be put in to make that happen. This sketch here shows a good analogy. Once the rock is at the top of the hill, it will then move down the hill of its own accord under the force of gravity. But it requires some extra applied energy to get it to the top of the hill in the first place. In chemical terms, think about a gas flame. You know that natural gas, which is mostly methane, burns in oxygen and that this is an exothermic reaction. But if you release some natural gas into the air at room temperature, it doesn't just burst into flame all by itself a spark or an extra flame is needed to get it going. The heat from that spark or flame provides just enough energy to get the reaction started, to start breaking bonds, and after that it will proceed of its own accord, which would be the gas burning. Some reactions have really big activation energies and need a lot of energy to be put in before the reaction will start, while others have small activation energies and they're really easy to start. Think back to those endothermic examples in the last video. The cold pack reaction had a very small activation energy, so simply mixing the chemicals was enough to get it going. Whereas decomposing copper carbonate requires a lot of bonds to be broken, so it has a large activation energy, and that's why it needed to be heated in order for the reaction to occur. So we can now put this together to draw a diagram that shows how the chemical energy in a reaction changes during the course of the reaction. 
Our y-axis represents energy and the units we use for energy are usually kilojoules per mole. Kilojoules is a measure of energy, mole is a measure of how much chemical we've got. Uh, we're going to deal with those units in more detail later on uh, in this course. So for now you just need to know that it's kilojoules per mole. So our x-axis is time. This is sometimes called the reaction coordinate. Really all it needs to represent is that this is the beginning of the reaction and this is the reaction proceeding and this is the end of the reaction. Okay, if this is an exothermic reaction, then our reactants at the beginning of the reaction have more energy than the products at the end of the reaction. The difference between those two energies is delta H, the change in enthalpy. You can see this is going from a high value to a low value, so the change is a negative one. And that's what uh, shows that it's exothermic. Finally, we need to show how the energy varies during the course of the reaction. What happens is this. First we have to put in the activation energy that will get things started. So the reaction energy increases and increases until it reaches the point where there's sufficient energy for the reactant bonds to start breaking and the atoms to rearrange. At that point product molecules start being made and energy starts being released. So the energy decreases and decreases until all the reactants have been transformed into products and we're at the product energy level. If you look at the difference between the reactant energy and the top of our little curve here, that shows you what the value of the activation energy is. That was how much energy had to be put in above the value of the reactants in order to get the reaction started. OK, now let's try drawing a diagram for an endothermic reaction. If it's endothermic, then energy is absorbed and our reactants at the beginning of the reaction have less energy than the products at the end. So in this case, the enthalpy is going from a low value to a high value, so the change is a positive one. Now again, we need to show how the energy varies during the course of the reaction. So we put in the activation energy to get things started. For an endothermic reaction, activation energy has to be at least as big as the enthalpy change, because if the reactants are going to be transformed into the products, they need to get up to at least the enthalpy of those products. So we draw the activation energy up here. And then there's a little decrease as the product molecules are formed and we end up at the product enthalpy level. Okay, so here's your task for this video. I've got drawn uh, an energy diagram here and I've put it on an actual numbered scale. So we've got some values for our enthalpies. Uh, first, I'd like you to work out what's the value of delta H, the enthalpy change for this reaction. And then I'd like you to work out what's the value of the activation energy. Uh, then tell me whether it's an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. And then finally, imagine that you could run the reaction in reverse. So you're starting at the products and you're going back to the reactants. What can you say in this case about the energy changes for that reverse reaction? Okay, that's the end of section one.